Kevin Johnson is a superb, great entrepreneur, public speaker. Um, so he's uh, he's made his first million, um, and he was in his 20. He has amazing stories to share, but he's not going to share about his entrepreneurship stories today. But very much want to like talk about angel investing. Um, he's got a lot of experience in that area. As we approach Idea Week for some of the for those 2021 that's joining us, we're approaching Idea Week. So understanding how do you raise your um, angel investments um, when you're building out the company, it's gonna be an important aspect of building the business when you first start. So we're really happy today to have um, Kevin join us. Um, Kevin, your show. Thanks, first, thank you, you all for giving me the opportunity to share. Um, I'd like to jump right in, so, so let's get started. Thanks everybody for for joining us again. Uh, I'm Kevin Johnson, EMBA class of 21 and entrepreneur. I'm joined by uh, the brilliant and affable Devin Weejay Singha. He'll be coming on a little bit later and I'll introduce you all to him uh, in a moment. Uh, by the way, uh, please keep your questions or rather put your questions in the chat. I'll stop for questions in about 15 minutes. Afterwards, I'll do the second half of the presentation and then we'll have an opportunity for more questions. Essentially, the second half will be dedicated to our guest, Devin, sharing his experiences and answering questions too. So uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, I think we'll also have a lot more participation. Many of you are in the investment community, so feel free to chime in. But again, let's get started. My overall goal this evening is to demystify angel investing. The topic is nebulous, pun intended, for many, uh, even those in the investment world. Some of you have experience in angel investing or investing in general. So again, thanks for joining us and I welcome your comments and questions a little later on in the session. There is so much I could cover but these are the topics that I've chosen to give you an introductory uh, basic understanding of angel investing. We'll talk about what is angel investing and who are angels, how they think, where they hang out. And by the way, the, the term angel comes from Broadway. I don't know if many of you know that, but decades ago, those who funded Broadway shows were called angels. And I guess that's the name that, that stuck. Uh, we'll discuss the angel investment world specifically some summary statistics about the angel community. Uh, we'll discuss the angel investment process. And I think this will be most helpful to entrepreneurs looking to raise funds for the first time. Talk about choosing the right angel, which is so important. Uh, angels versus demons uh, or venture capitalists. I couldn't resist the play on words and other worldly analogy. Uh, and if there are any VCs present for this session, please forgive my quip. I, I mean no harm. <laughs> um, we'll also talk about some tips for raising funds from an angel, uh, and we'll take your questions and our answers. And finally, we'll close with some resources for further investigation uh, on your own part and my contact information if you want more information or you just have a question for me. Uh, by the way, this deck that you all see will be available to all of you. I'll post a link in the PDF uh, to the PDF in the chat during the question and answer session. Or again, feel free to email me, call me, um, or any way you want to communicate text. That I don't mind. Uh, so let's have some fun. Let's get get to uh, learning about angel investing. Uh, as I thought about how to introduce Devin and myself, I realized that there are many coincidences in our histories, and I'll attempt to point some of those out. I personally caught the entrepreneurial bug in 1999 in Massachusetts. Uh, my best friend Tom, an MIT student at the time, would take me to MIT's Athena Lab during the summer to hack. I was interning at IBM, actually Lotus, a subsidiary during the summer while attending Morehouse College. And I created my first company there at MIT's campus during the summer. A little bit into the future, in 2005, I had the opportunity to work with Magic Johnson Enterprises, and that'll be important a little uh, further down the line. 
Uh, there's a picture of, of Magic and me <laughs> at a party. In 2007, I had the opportunity to learn directly from Peter Kite, who sold his company to Check Free, uh, or sold his company Check Free to Fiserv for $4.4 billion. His story is an amazing one. And, and now that I think about it, I literally live right down the street from Fiserv here in, in Alpharetta, Georgia. Uh, in 2010, I began working with the Ariel Southeast Angel Partners. It's an angel group based in the Hilton Head, South Carolina and Savannah, Georgia area. It was a great experience. In fact, the president of the organization was a Sloney named Ray Wenig. Uh, he, again, he went to MIT, unbeknown to me at the time, I would be attending. In 2012, I met Devin, whose company e uh, was acquired by Magic Johnson Enterprises. In fact, it was honored as the deal of the year. And that same year, Devin became the president of Atlanta's major angel group called the Atlanta Technology Angels. So I could consider joining, but I wanted to uh, focus on building my own company. Uh, but I would visit from time to time. Uh, also that same year, Devin became CEO of Insight Pool. Uh, they eventually raised um, an impressive $4 million in a Series A round. And Peter Kite, who I mentioned before, was an investor in that deal. Um, and by the way, Devin invited me to see his company's early version of its software. I passed on it, so <laughs> I missed that ship. And there, there have been many opportunities or many ships that I've, I've actually missed. In 2013, Devin provided a nice quotation for my book that I launched, The Entrepreneur Mind. Some of you uh, have received that book. Thanks for your support. And I don't think Devin knows this if, if he's joined us, but the book actually was put on the list of the greatest entrepreneur books of all time. So thanks, Devin. I appreciate that. We're well um, on the road to selling a million copies. In 2016, Devin and I raced Porsches in San Francisco. Devin is a huge car fanatic. Uh, Porsche became one of my clients. And I mentioned that because it's fun, but I actually haven't seen Devin in about four years. So uh, I'm glad that he'll be helping us out this evening. Uh, and finally, in 2020 this year, Devin's company that I mentioned earlier, Insight Pool, was acquired by Cision for $2.7 billion. And yes, that's billion with a B. Um, meanwhile, Kevin goes to MIT. So it's full circle for me and into the thermosphere of uh, success for Devin. And we'll hear some more from him a little he's later. He's here, Kevin. Just so you know, Devin is, uh, is on. He's been on uh, from pretty much as soon as he started. Oh, great. Great. Wonderful. Um, so let's dive a little deeper. What is angel investing? Simply put, it's the act of providing funding to early stage startups. And early stage implies pre-investment to nothing beyond series A for this presentation. Uh, I'll explain more later about the stages, but we'll focus on the first two rounds of fundraising, seed and series A. Keep in mind too, that about 50% of companies that receive financing from angels have no revenues when they received the angel investment these early companies are, are generally less than three years old. Who are these angels? Well, most angels are former entrepreneurs who miss the excitement of launching a business. Many have launched their own companies, made significant money, and now want to help younger entrepreneurs achieve success. That's certainly the case with me and, and how I feel about it. Demographically, angels tend to be middle-aged white males though this is changing, more and more angels from diverse backgrounds are becoming more prevalent and prominent. They've been investing for about 10 years and are 55 years old. 90% have college degrees and more than half hold a graduate degree, well-educated. If they are in an angel group, then they make about one or two investments per year. Uh, and, and perhaps Devin can speak to that a little bit later, but that's uh, a little bit that I received from the statistics and we'll talk a little bit more in depth coming up. Uh, it's important to note that there are accredited angels and non-accredited angels. Accredited angels meet the Securities and Exchange Commission requirements 
these requirements are there to protect investors from losing money. So here are the requirements and you can see if you meet the test. You must have earned an income uh, that exceeded $200,000 or $300,000 together with a spouse in each of the prior two years and reason, uh, reasonably expect the same for the current year. Or you have to have a net worth of $1 million, either alone or together with a spouse, excluding the value of your primary residence. In this presentation, we won't cover angels that aren't accredited. Um, there are other options we could go into, and we'll save that for another time. By the way, there are some new platforms, some exciting platforms like Republic uh, that are popping up for anyone to invest in private companies. And you know what? Um, there may be some of you that are interested in that. So I will pop a link to uh, Republic in the chat right now. Um, and you can check that out. Let's see. Well, I don't seem to have that link, but I think the website is republic.co. So you can visit that on your own time, but it's a really, really cool platform that I encourage you to check out. Um, that's really democratizing investing. Uh, and finally, let's see. Well, let's take a step back. So there are individual angels and groups of angels. And we'll focus on those. There might be individuals who invest, but I would say it's more difficult or tedious. There are many benefits to being in an angel group. Some examples of the groups are the Atlanta Tech, uh, Technology Angels, which I um, definitely participate in from now and then, uh, every now and then. There are the Boston Harbor Angels. There are the HBS Angels of Boston. Uh, by the way, there is not, to my knowledge, an MIT Angel Group. So I think that's too bad. Maybe I'm just not in the know, but I think perhaps that would be a good idea to uh, pursue. There uh, is th one, Kevin. Oh, there is. FYI. Yes, there is found. one. Please, you'll have to share with uh, all of us, perhaps in the, uh, in the latter portion of the presentation, uh, all about that. So I'd, I'd be super excited. I mean, I know about Caster Ventures. They're, I think they're doing a little bit more in the venture capitalist side, but no, please do let me know because that would be super awesome to be a part of that. Um, so yeah, we'll focus on the angel groups and the, group, uh, the groups tend to be in the same city or region. So the Atlanta Technology Angels, uh, for example, fluctuates around 100 members or angels give or take a few dozen. And so finally there exists accelerators and to a lesser degree incubators that have angels. Accelerators taking companies that have developed products or services and they just need a boost, you know? Um, incubators are more laxed, and these programs essentially create their own deal flow by attracting companies that are ready to grow. And examples are the famous Y Combinator and Techstars. So let's go to a, a fun activity here. Let's test your knowledge. We'll jump right in, and then I'll do a little explaining afterwards. Uh, change up the pace. So here we have a fictitious angel investment portfolio. All right. Oh, thanks, Antonio. I appreciate you uh, making that comment. Good to, to see you're on with us. Um, the maximum time that you want to support a company, in my opinion, and this differs, is around 10 years in the angel world. And 10 years is a pretty long time horizon. Ideally, you get a return faster than 10 years. And here we have 10 companies and their names are across the top. The red figures represent investments and the green represents returns on those investments for each column. Uh, in general, angels must fund deals with scale and they must invest in many companies. Uh, and they're looking anywhere from 10 to 20 times their investment, not three. Three is kind of average, but you know, we want to hit some home runs here. Uh, the average return on investment is actually around three times investment over about four years. And the internal rate of return is about 25%. Um, and about 7% of deals yield 75% of returns. Again, so 7% of deals yield about 75% of returns. That gives you an idea 
of what to expect. So a diverse portfolio wins and you want your duds to die super fast. Um, finally, a merger or acquisition is more realistic than going public. Um, and so here's a simple question for all of you. Uh, and it's a simple true or false question. And the question is, the least amount invested in a company yielded the highest return and the greatest amount invested in a company yielded the lowest return. True or false? I'll give you a few seconds to chime in. Again, the question is, uh, or the true false question is, the least amount invested in a company yielded the highest return and the greatest amount invested in a company yielded the lowest return. True, true or false? I think I see people chiming in already. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, and Kurt, man, you, you guys are, are, are smack on. I, I, I don't want to give it away, <laughs> but you guys are on top of things. I wouldn't expect anything less uh, than that. So yeah, you guys, oh, I, I heard somebody. I was just thinking, I, I see that the write-up, Kevin, uh, if, if easier, maybe for next time we can do the yes, no on the participant. Um, part so where you have the person view versus the chat but it's fine for what we're doing right now thank you thank you and and i think all of you guys got it right so I, <laughs> maybe i jumped ahead a bit but uh and the answer is true so import bio received seventy five thousand in investment funds but was a dud and xy cam received ten thousand and returned a hit a handsome six hundred thousand dollars handsome return uh, so moving on, uh, to give you an idea of the amount of money invested by angels, in particular group investments, here's a graph telling us the average investment and median investment by investment stage. We see that the seed or initial round of fundraising has a median investment of $400,000. Uh, the average is higher at $1.1 million. The subsequent Series A round has significantly higher figures as the values of the companies increase and they you know, get more traction. I imagine that the, the average and median investment by individual angels operating alone and not in a group would be lower. Um, not so sure, that's just a guess. Um, but based on these numbers, we can see just how impressive Devin's $4 million raise at the Series A level uh, a few years ago is. And, and you'll have an opportunity to talk to him about that. Um, Ah, did I jump ahead? Let's see. I think so. So let's look at some angel deals by industry. Uh, this graph gives, gives us an idea of what angels are investing in. Uh, this data is from 2019 and shows that angels, group angels, are inclined to invest in information technology, which represents about 29% of all transactions. Uh, next, we have consumer products and services at 25% healthcare at 20% and business products and services at 16%. Information technology is actually down from 2019 about 10%. I was a little bit shocked about that and, and actually shocked to see that financial services is so low in the angel world, but it actually increased with the, grow, uh, the growth of FinTech. So uh, there's a bright spot there. And final slide before we, we jump into some questions so far. Uh, in this slide, we have some national statistics. In the upper left-hand corner, we see the gender and ethnicity of CEOs who have been funded. A mere 16% of underrepresented ethnicities receive funding. And moreover, a mere 17% of CEOs who receive funding were women. We see that 84% of all funding goes to white CEOs. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to dive into deal structures. I would love to do that, but I encourage you to re uh, you know, research more on your own about the common types of deals or terms. Regarding deals by investment stage, in the uh, upper right-hand corner, we see that a majority of deals are new and a lesser portion is follow-on. In other words, a company may need additional funds after an initial investment. And then at the bottom, you can see the percentage of deals in each region. Uh, this was a bit shocking to me, uh, um, but you've got the, the Northwest and the Southeast outpacing the other regions. And so 
to me, this is a very informative graphic and sort of helps you understand the angel uh, universe or galaxy, I should say. Um, so now we'll pause for a few minutes. Uh, the first half of the presentation is, is over and we'll take any questions um, about the first half of the presentation and Angel and Valentina, thank you so much. We'll facilitate that and then uh, we'll move on to the second half and feel free to jump in Devin who's, who's joined us and is our special guest. So uh, again, if you have any questions, chime in definitely. Um, so Chris Lachlan had a question. Um, Chris, do you want to ask directly or do you want me to help? Well, I think the question got answered already, but it was uh, about whether one through uh, any sort of formal process to become an accredited investor or just had to meet those criteria you listed. You know, that's a great question and there's been some confusion around that for me personally. So I, I would rather defer to either Angel or Devin on that one. I think I came into the Angel world with the assumption that you had to meet those requirements and and you actually do you know your own homework or self-certify right so it's it's not so much a formal process by the angel group or the ones some of that i've been affiliated with in looking at your financials and making sure that you're meeting those criteria so um yeah it seems like it's on the honor program or the uh, you know, the honor program, so, so to speak. Ke Kevin, there, there's a standard form that you can send as a, as a uh, startup owner, a standard form you can send out that uh, ask your potential angel investors to just answer a few questions. And that satisfies the uh, requirement. No, thank you. I, I appreciate um, you chiming in on that. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's less, I guess my initial impression is, is it's less formal than I thought it would be. I thought it would be. You're absolutely right. Right. I thought it would be, hey, you know, show me your tax documents. Show me how much or how many assets you have. And it's really not that. It's really um, what, what you explained. Thank you. Shabda, I think you are, you are next with uh, your raised hand if you want to unmute and ask. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you know, this question is really informative. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, sure. I have a quick question. What is the average ticket size of uh, annual investment? And uh, would you have like any graphics sort of like, you know, which sector is receiving uh, what sort of investment? I don't know so, if you already covered this. Um, I think, did we, or did I, did I miss? We had uh, a slide about the, the group investment in the round size. So I don't know if we did get to cover that. But this, this graph here sort of shows you what the investments look like. And I think we did cover this, yeah. So in the C round, um, you can see on the graphic, you're gonna average around $400,000 as a median investment. Um, uh, the average is actually a little higher than that. I prefer to go by the median because some deals just skew, skew the data upward. Um, and then on a series A, of course, you're going to have a little bit more, well, not a little bit, but a significant amount more uh, investment size there. So I would just refer you to this slide. Definitely take a look at the deck and it'll really help you understand what type of investment we're talking about. And this could be a group investment, right? So as a group of angels, you could put in a million collectively. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, but that, that's a little bit about the investment size. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Boyan, um, I think you were next. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll go next. Yeah. First of all, yeah. Thank you for this session. And uh, I really enjoyed sure. the first uh, investment and um, investment session. And I'm uh, grateful that you guys uh, organized the second one. Um, I have a couple of questions in terms of uh, equity um, that uh, the founders are kind of on average uh, um, giving up for the angel investment or what's the amount of equity usually that that's at stake. Um, and in terms of valuation, is it usually the founders that uh, come up with the valuation or it, uh, it's some kind of negotiation between the investors and the, and the founders? Sure. I'll, I'll speak to the latter uh, first. That's, 
uh, what uh, quickly came to mind. So both sides are sort of trying to agree on this valuation. And as an entrepreneur, and I know Antonio can attest to this perhaps, a lot of times entrepreneurs own valuation is going to be a lot higher uh, than what the angel comes up with. And there are many different ways of coming up with that valuation. And we'll talk about that in the second half. So um, to answer your question, you've got the entrepreneur's valuation and then you've got the angel's valuation. And I think that's where the opportunity to come together and create a term sheet and, and, and uh, align on the valuation there. Um, to the first part, uh, Devin, did you want to chime in on, on equity? Uh, I mean, you've seen uh, many deals and can give us a real sense of the, the range versus me giving an average. Yeah, so typically what you want to think of is um, in your earlier rounds, you're going to probably look at 20% uh, uh, is kind of the going ratio uh, in earlier rounds. And then as you get past the a round and the B round, it might go to 15% and then the C round might go to 10. And then after that, you know, D round and stuff, it, it goes significantly lower. The point is, is that, you know, uh, in the early stage for angel investing, you know, uh, the valuation is key for angels to get in because they take the most risk because some things that are not shared is that, um, you know, he who holds the gold is who controls the terms. And so let's just say an angels put in a million bucks and then the company has not hit all the metrics. And then a VC says, Hey, I'm going to put in $5 million. Well, they can go to the angels and be like, um, yeah, how much you owned before we're going to recalibrate all that. And if you want our money, you'll just have to do it or not. And so, uh, again, typically it's 20% in the earlier ones and then as you go on it gets less uh but it's usually a, a reason for that to be uh typically that high because you're taking the most amount of risk in the capital structure in the beginning thank you great no problem. thanks so yeah, we'll, we'll move on oh there is one more question from bob i don't know if you want to take that you want to hold off until the end if you don't mind, uh, yeah, I would it. like to get through the second half and then we'll open it up. I think we'll have more than enough time, but I want to be sure that I get through the second half, especially since I may answer some of these, these pending questions. Awesome. Thank you. No, thank, thank you all. So let's change direction and focus now on the angel investing process. That will be especially helpful for entrepreneurs. Uh, I'll cover these from the entrepreneur's perspective in, in most part. And this scenario applies uh, mostly to angel groups, uh, which are perhaps the most organized. And there's a lot of data about the angel group. So um, that's why I'm focusing on them. Um, first, uh, or the first step is finding and applying. So definitely use the internet to your advantage. I'd say as opposed to a decade ago, there are a lot more angels online and it's relatively easy to find their websites. Many of these websites are really helpful and outline how to apply. For example, the Atlanta Technology Angels has the process outlined uh, on their website. You apply online by answering questions, then 12 members pre-screen and rate each application for funding. Then the top three to five companies pitch to investor screening teams. Afterwards, you pitch to a full member meeting with two other companies, and then the deep dive begins. There are, uh, or these member meetings happen monthly, uh, and all member angels are welcome. In fact, a lot of these meetings have been happening, ha happening virtually. So uh, as an entrepreneur, you've got to be able to present in person as well as virtually uh, and close the deal uh, in the new world, so to speak, or the new normal. Uh, and actually, a lot of these angel groups open up their doors so you can be a guest. In fact, uh, when Devin uh, invited me to the first Atlanta Technologies, uh, Atlanta Technology Angels, I took him up on that invitation and was able to uh, attend before seriously considering, considering joining. But um, I suggest you all do that at some point in your lives, uh, if you're especially interested in angel investing. Uh, you'll learn a lot and it's great networking. So next is pitching. You'll pitch for 10 to 15 minutes, which includes a Q&A session. Uh, most pitches use PowerPoint or Prezi. Uh, they may have some video. Uh, and uh, a lot of companies have prototypes 
or products on hand. And you got to be careful with that. I, I've seen some, <laughs> some presentations go awry, you know, demos fail or the product falls apart. So you, you got to know what you're doing. Um, next is due diligence, which is like a, a thorough background check on everything, you and your business. If there are interested angels in your company, you'll get a deal lead who will take you through the due diligence process. Uh, interested angels often form an LLC, which will be the entity that actually invests in your company if you, you know, jump through the due diligence hoops. Uh, during due diligence, angels and their staff go through your financials, they check references, they consult industry experts, they make sure that you are who you say you are. Um, it's a long and, well, often can be a long and arduous process for both parties. Um, based on some research, I saw that the median length is around 20 hours uh, with a mean being uh, 60 hours for due diligence. Um, in general, the more due diligence, the higher multiple on your return. And then uh, the next steps that we'll talk about uh, or give an overview of our valuation, term sheets, investment, post-investment, and exit which will be covered in upcoming slides. Valuation methods. Um, for those who don't know what valuation is, it's simply the process of determining the present value of an asset or how much business or how much your business is worth. It's perhaps more art than science and there are many ways that you can do this. I could actually do an entire semester of sessions uh, just on this topic and the different methods. Um, although there are dozens of models and thumb rules which angels use to apply valuation for pre-revenue venture, uh, a pre-revenue venture, uh, I'll describe just a few, and some of these are the most common. So feel free again to research the others, or email me, and I can send you more information. Um, and these are certainly not exhaustive, even though it's a pretty long list. Um, some angels are more thorough or tedious than others. So the venture capital method, VCM for short, is is very common. Uh, many angels know that rarely do entrepreneurs adequately forecast the total amount of capital they'll need. So they figure that every successful venture will require support from the VC community. In other words, angels assume, and this is a generalization, that entrepreneurs are rarely successful with just angel money. Uh, VCM calculations require a terminal value at five years, for example, and you receive the pro forma revenues from the venture in year five, and then each team member guesses the fifth year revenues. And so these, these guesses are averaged and used to enter the VCM spreadsheet. Lots of spreadsheets if you like spreadsheets. So it gets more complicated, so I'll stop there, but it gives you a little insight to the VCM method. Uh, a couple more, the discounted cash flow, DCF, or net present value, NPV model is popular too. We'll probably get into some of that next semester, EMBA 21s, um, or this semester in the fall. Uh, this method focuses on cash. If we can make a reasonable prediction of the future cash flows of a firm, then we can value the stream of cash like we would a bond or an annuity. And since cash flows from startups are not certain or safe, by far, uh, we use a higher discount rate to adjust for that higher risk. Um, finally, uh, in this quick overview, uh, is the scorecard method. This method is, is interesting to me. You essentially determine a median value for pre-revenue companies, say $3 million in a given industry or region. Then you assign a percentage weighting each critical issue calculate the weighted average of the issues and then multiply the median value by the weighted average. You can use issues like management, uh, uh, the business opportunity, sales, competition, and so forth to get your, your weighted average multiple. And by the way, for our operation, our operations pitch decks that we had to go through recently, actually my team, we use sort of a makeshift risk factor summation method valuation on, on a lot of you guys' projects. Uh, projects. Uh, here is an example of a term sheet. It comes from Y Combinator, a popular Silicon Valley accelerator program. And a term sheet is basically an outline of the material terms and conditions of a business agreement. It's, I mean, the final agreement and what comes next and contains all the legal terms. So I think Jay Johnson is with us. So 
uh, uh, as I see the term sheet, I'm, I'm thinking of those great attorneys that can really put together uh, great term sheets and, and get all the legalese correct. Um, I won't go into detail, but I just wanted you to see what it looks like, especially those who are completely new to angel investing. Uh, it's a term that, again, can be pretty, pretty nebulous uh, or vague. Um, and here you can see some basic terms like voting rights and uh, liquidation preference, which are so important. But again, that's, that's directly from Y Combinator. Uh, and you can take a look at that. The address is down there on the left. So next we have the investment period and we're gonna get into an activity and then go back to more questions to, to end it. Uh, you've passed due diligence, you've ex uh, executed the term sheet and eventually get the money in the bank. It's time to go to work. So the money comes after about three to six months, which by the way means the CEOs have to be out in front of cash requirements to give themselves enough runway. And so let's look at a, capital, a capitalization table or cap table for short, that's a mouthful. Uh, and basically a cap table shows ownership, equity, dilution, and the value of equity in each round of investment by founders, investors, and other owners. So let's do a quick activity. Take a look at the cap table. Um, there are two simple questions to test uh, your understanding of this. So uh, I, I don't think we have the polls or survey, so I'll, I'll go ahead and just, just ask you those. So, uh, and feel free to, to chime in via the chat. So how many angel investors invested in this company? Pretty straightforward, very basic. How many angels, uh, how many angel investors invested in this company? Take a look, we've got uh, multiple columns there. I see someone says five, someone says five, another five. Give you a few more seconds. I see a lot of fives. Ah, oh, I see a four. Okay, all right. <laughs> so we have a little bit more variability with this question. This is this is good, and I hope that it's uh, legible. I apologize. I, I, what you see is actually an upgrade, thanks to Angel, from what I had before. But it's still not optimal. Um, but again, I hope you guys can see that. Someone says six, so we've got six, five, and four. What, what do you think is the right answer? Anyone care to chime in? I see Ahmed, I'll, I'll just give it to you and, and then I'll give you the second, uh, the second question. Um, well, no, let's go ahead to the second one and we'll review both of them at the same time. So collectively, how much did the angels invest? Oh, thanks, Angel, I appreciate that. Oh, someone says 10, wow, we've got some great variability there. Um, so again, the question is how much did the angels collectively invest in this company? I see a C, I don't remember the amount associated with C, but um, I see 500, 500K. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move forward, but thanks everybody for participating. Uh, I, I think I got this right. Other experts out there, let me know. Um, but here is the answer, and you can see if you, you got it right. So uh, you can see in the red square that we, we actually have four angels. So those of you who said four are correct. And they collectively invested how much? Well, they, they got 500 shares at, what was the price? 50 cents per share. So you can actually see in the green down there. So the, the correct amount that the angels invested collectively is 250,000. And you can see there that the post money valuation is $750,000. So that, that makes sense. Uh, but again, you all have access to this deck. You can take a look at the cap table and, and look at the answers and, and uh, get a better idea of how it all works. But thanks for playing. Uh, and so, you know, once you have received your money on investment, you want to check in with the angels and provide them periodic updates. 
right? You don't want them to just be hanging out there. Some angels are more involved than others, but I think it's important that you be proactive in reporting and try to set a consistent check-in date, super important. And then regarding the final exit stage, the goal is to have a successful exit. And most of the time that means a merger or acquisition. Again, an IPO is not very likely. And the general rule for angels, angel investors, is if you can't get your money out, don't put it in. In other words, if there's no exit, then exit, <laughs> right? Um, so again, thanks for, for playing. Um, the remaining slides, I suggest that you look at on your own time. Uh, this slide shows the difference between angels and venture capitalists. Um, this uh, next one emphasizes that you choose the right angel for you. You don't want to just go after the money. If you do, you'll likely regret it. And then lastly, before we have some time, more time with Devin, um, here are some of my tips for raising funds from an angel. The biggest tip here to me is to know what angels want, right? And angels in general uh, want seasoned management, which a lot of us have, right? Uh, investment on, uh, of your own money and time. If you have no skin in the game, then why are we here? Uh, well-written business plans with great financials. Uh, we want you to be, uh, be prepared for due diligence, able to answer any question, and, and I add answer quickly. Uh, we want a clean corporate structure, right? So if you've got tons of people and a cap table that's multiple pages, that could be a problem. Uh, we like intellectual property, right? We know an IPO is not likely. So if in the case of liquidation, we want to be able to sell some assets or um, be able to use that. Uh, we, a completed prototype is important. We want revenue, hockey stick growth, and, and so on. So for me, definitely understand what angels want. Uh, and then uh, I'll shut up and let Devin uh, answer any questions about what he's up to. And by the way, congratulations, Devin. I saw that you were appointed to uh, a board, I think four to, four to five. Um, but anyway, you can talk to that. Um, and again, Devin is great, really good friend. I'm glad he could join us. And um, let's have at it. Let's have some good, some good questions. Thanks, Hal. We've got some questions from Tom. Um, sure. Tom, how are you still here? Yep, still here. Hi, Tom. Do you want me to, hey, um, so I asked the question in the chat. Um, basically, the gist of my question comes down to, you know, we're as angels investing at such early stages, right? And the outcomes of these companies is primarily going to be binary. It's, a, it's either going to take off or it's going to be a bust. And so I'm curious if you have any strong opinion about entry price and this whole concept of being quote unquote disciplined about, you know, what valuations we should be going up to, or does it really not matter, right? Like is the, the biggest hurdle, the company getting to um, a VC firm uh, stage or round after us, and then eventually having the chance to become a unicorn, um, or would you take the approach of no, you know, entry price really matters and, you know, we need to be really disciplined about entry price uh, that we come in at. Great question. I'll, I'll let Devin take that one. I, uh, this is Devin's show at this point. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, entry, entry price is, uh, you know, significant. There's different things like uh, convertible debt instruments and other things that will protect uh, a price point. So for example, you could go, and say, hey, I'm not going to put a valuation on this, uh, but when it when a Series A round, I want to get that valuation minus 30%. Um, but the reality is, most angel rounds are anywhere, uh, you know, in the three to five million dollar total valuation stage. Um, you know, sometimes they could go a, a little bit higher, uh, but you know, traditionally that's that's where they lie, and you know. If you have a repeat team, repeat founder, know the market, X people from a company that, you know, they're in a market they already play in, all those things, you know, uh, play well. But I've, I've never seen like an angel round be valued, you know, uh, greater than $10 million. Like, uh, you know, at that stage, that's not really like an angel stage. So typically it's anywhere between three to five. 
Hey, Bob, do you want to come and ask your, your question? Yeah, actually, sure, that works. Um, and thanks again for putting this together. This is great. Um, really, the question, and I think, Kevin, you may have kind of touched on it, but wondering, do the angels typically stay in if you start to go through your Series A, Series B, Series C, or do they, do they typically get pushed aside by the larger investors that come in for, for those rounds, or do they stay and try to hold on to their equity? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So, so, uh, typically, you know, it depends on how big the round is and what the, what, what the VC needs to hit their fund target. So if you, like, remember like a VC has to deploy a certain amount of capital, they raise money from what's called LPs, which are limited partners. And say you have a huge VC like Sequoia capital that has a multi-billion dollar fund. Uh, they have to deploy, uh, you know, a certain amount per deal to make it worth it. So they can't just deploy $5 million, they have to deploy $25 million. And if the, if the valuation is, you know, 25 million and it's at a hundred million, they have to buy 25%. And sometimes they have to take pieces of angels to accomplish uh, how much they need to buy uh, because that's just how big their fund is. Uh, if it's a smaller fund or a smaller check, that doesn't usually have to happen. And they usually don't want to buy the founders equity because they want the founders to stay in, uh, you know, hardcore uh, up until uh, up until the end. So sometimes they'll buy the angels, but it's usually only on a big round. Got it. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Devin, a question from Ahmed is um, how, how early do you go to an angel investment? So do you wait until you're more mature st state of your, uh, with, with your innovation or how, how do you know is the right time? Yeah, so, you know, the, the right time to always be, uh, you know, it's kind of like the old sales saying, like, always be closing. But the reality is, like, you're always talking. And usually an angel investment um, is when you've shown some customer traction, like you've built something, and then somebody's either a user or they're buying something. Uh, and usually then you can establish, like, group think. Like, because angels talk to other angels, and, you know, Half the time they just care about yakking to each other on the golf course or, you know, shit like that. So like, you know, the reality is, is like you want to, uh, you know, be always out there early, but usually when you get a few early adopters is when you want to go to the angels. Yeah. If, if I can jump in, Devin, I would, I would love to ask uh, more about your personal experience in raising funds. So, for for you, what what has been your secret sauce, your success to being able to raise at the angel level multiple times, and to, to you know corral multiple angels? Uh, and from that, what are your your tips for budding entrepreneurs? Yeah, so the number one thing is remember, like you know, uh, you know, angel investing is a contact sport, but it's also uh, you know one that involves you know kind of herding cats. And so the reality is, is always getting one kick-ass or two kick-ass leaders that everybody wants to be like. And you're like, oh. And the other thing about raising angel funds is to make your round always look oversubscribed. If you go out there and say like, I'm raising $2 million and I have $100,000, people are like, oh, okay, good luck. Like, get out of my face. If you say, I'm raising $500,000 and I've got, you know, I'm oversubscribed. Uh, and we think we'll have to open the round up some more because it's oversubscribed. That psychological shit just plays to everybody. So, you know, when you're going to go out there and talk to angels, you know, make sure that um, you make them really want to play to win like they have to get in uh, versus trying to go out there with kind of like a, big swinging ambition in terms of round size uh, and just look kind of foolish when you say like, oh, I've got 10% of that covered. Every, all angels want to know who's in and uh, how much do you have left? So my success has always been in parlaying that, uh, you know, and using that to my advantage. Great. No, thanks. Did, did we have any other questions in the chat or shall I continue with my... Did Tia has a question. 
Okay. Um, his question Hi, was, Kevin. how do you uh, factor in... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Angel. Go ahead. Um, oh, well, no, no, thanks no. a lot for, um, you know, having... Uh, this is quite in informational. Uh, my question to you is, like, a lot of times during these um, talks with the angel investors, the, the topic of sweat equity comes in. How, how do you factor it in the valuation of the company? And how do you tackle that question? Uh, so I'll take that too, if, if that's okay, Kevin. So like sweat equity is not usually for like angels, but sometimes an angel can be also an advisor and then you set up an advisor uh, options pool, but usually that's minimal. It's usually less than 5%. And so you might give a, like a board member, like an independent board member might get like 1% to 3% which is 3% would be really big. Uh, an angel, let's just say they're going to be an advisory board member, might get like half a percent if they're putting in sweat equity that's on top of, you know, their, uh, their actual cash investment. But usually sweat equity is valued at the option pricing, uh, whereas dollars in, uh, you know, is, is valued at, at, the, at the round value. So like, you know, typically if somebody sells, the angels get like one times uh, what's called preferred. And so if something, let's say you raise $10 million and only sells for $10 million, the angels get their $10 million back. Whereas the option holder, like an advisor, uh, wouldn't get anything uh, because that only gets paid out after everybody gets paid out. But usually it's like a half a half a percent on true sweat equity if you're an angel. I see. Th thanks a lot. And a follow-up is, uh, do angels do ask for, if they're going to be actively involved in the process, do they ask for sweat equity as well? No, not typically. That's just, that. That's something that usually comes to bear, and then as they help the company, that will come to light. Uh, you know, typically early on in the investment process, basically like everybody says they're going to help, and almost no one does. So, like, it's kind of dumb to you know dilute dilute that that much until usually the entrepreneur gets away with saying like, absolutely, let's get you involved. Let's see, you know, how that works. Let's make sure we can make good use of your time, and you know, then Bob's your uncle and all of a sudden you get that. But usually it's like less than 10% of the people actually do anything. Thank you. No problem. Hey, Devin, what is, what is your biggest success as an angel investor? And then what is your biggest mistake as an angel investor? If we can share. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, uh, you know, um, angel investing is really hard. My biggest success has probably come from things that have failed and then the entrepreneur did something else and I was able to like, because I supported them when they failed, I supported them when they succeeded. You, you should never count on, you know, the, the first deal uh, always going well. But the, uh, the biggest mistake is always following a shiny object. And, you know, the shiny object, like one of the companies I invested in was called uh, Elf Island. And it was like an online game that like kids would play but then it also like affected stuff in real life and uh you know the comps were like you know club penguin and or, or stuff like that that disney bought and this that, and the other and really the company that i invested in had nothing to do with anything close and was nowhere near uh you know created the potential that some of these other ones did so i just followed a, a shiny object and you know lost a couple hundred grand uh, on that so that 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 sucked um, but usually it's, uh, but the worst mistake is always when an entrepreneur calls you and you're like, you're only now hearing about that the company's running out of money and they're like, oh, we can't meet payroll next week. Like, what the hell did you call me before for? That's a huge telltale sign. Like they're, um, they're just not, you know, you, you're just not good entrepreneurs if you do that. And that's a, that's a mistake if you then invest again. So those are kind of the my best and, and, and worst, uh, you know, is usually betting on that jockey. Great. I have a quick question. On average, how many angels or angel groups should I expect to pitch before receiving funding? Just to kind of give an idea. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, you know, so groups is one thing, but usually you're talking about five. Uh, individuals, another thing, usually you're talking about 50. Like, if you want to get a million dollars, you probably have to pitch 50. 50 people, but hopefully you can do it in 
uh, you know, singular settings and stuff like that. But at the same time, like once one or two get in, they call their, they call their homies and they're like, Hey, look, uh, you know, I'm in this one. This is what we're doing. You should look at it. And then that weight holds a lot more. Like you're not usually starting cold. I'm being like, hello, my name's Kevin. This is what my company does. It's because that dog's not going to hunt. You're usually parlaying that, uh, you know, uh, initial folks. And then people are like kind of already ready to be in you and you just have to like screw it up to not get it. Uh, so if you hit the first few right that are the right lead angels, then it opens the door to the rest of them. Usually, usually like 50 people to get a million dollars. Hey, Devin, how do you look – when you're looking at the, the founding team, a lot of us are in this you know, mid-career, somewhere in the you know, 30 to 40 age range, plus or minus. Some people talk a lot about founding you know, young, out of college, um, have nothing to do but work, as opposed to somewhere we're in this nebulous age where we have like – uh, more family demands and other life demands, but we also have more experience. Could you talk about how you look at um, some of the, like the demographics or the, the characteristics of the founding team when you're analyzing that? Yeah. Like uh, I think most of the time, nobody cares. Like, so what I would say is, uh, and what I, I mean that good and bad. So if you're like, Oh, I have a family, I have this, well, nobody freaking cares. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm not putting my money behind, you know, are you coming up with excuses to tell me that you're not going to give it your all? Then get the hell out of the way. Like, you're not going to, the, the market is going to eat you up if you're not willing to, uh, you know, put it all out there. So, but what people do look for is, I don't care, you know, you could be 50 or you could be 20, but you have the innate drive and the willingness to like do whatever it takes. Um, and, you know, a lot of, most entrepreneurs do have families. Don't let Snapchat and that kind of shit fool you. Like they do have families, but usually their families are like ultra supporting. The best entrepreneurs are the ones that you're like, we like my mom, uh, you know, my mother-in-law like invested. And I, you know, that, like uh, that's, that comes with different pressures, but usually it's people that have a support system that also are supporting them. Uh, you know, if you have a wife or husband or whoever at home, that's like, you're an idiot. You should not do this. Uh, you know, that's a, that's kind of a, a limited shelf life. So usually it just doesn't matter as long as you're willing to give it all. If you come up with excuses of why you can't give it all, then you're not, you're not going to play in the game anyways. Thanks. So I think we're, we're hitting the hour. Um, and I just want to wrap up very quickly. Uh, there are some resources that I've provided in the deck that you can see here. Uh, and I've actually pulled some of the data from these resources. They're pretty good. Uh, and especially as we approach idea week, those two links at the bottom, the 150 common questions angels and VCs ask, I think that's really helpful going into idea week and pitching. Um, and then finally my contact information, I think, uh, we may be able to stay on five or 10 more minutes. If you'll stick around with us, Devin, if, is that okay? Yeah. Cool, cool. So if you want to stick around and have some more questions for Devin, uh, please do do that. But in general, thanks to Valentina and Angel for encouraging me to, to uh, do this. Uh, I've had a ball and I thank you all for attending. Is there anything that you all have to say uh, to promote the next session, Valentina? Or uh, so first of all, Kevin, Devin, thank you so much for taking the time, for sharing with us your experience. This was amazing. Our next investment series session is in two months. Uh, so it is, uh, I think, the third Wednesday of every two months we're doing the investment series. And then every the first Wednesday of every month is the digital transformation series. So that's where we get to learn a lot from each other. And this was really amazing. Um, I wish we had this before we did the OLAB uh, pitch, but uh, it's certainly helpful for our idea week. And uh, thank you so much. No problem. My pleasure. Thanks. With that, any, any other questions, feel free to, to chime in or put those in the, the chat. 
So I'm curious, Devin. I, I'm sorry. What are you working on now, man? Like, bring us up to speed. I haven't, I haven't seen you, seen you in like four years. So, so, so what are you up to? Yeah. So, so now what I'm up to is uh, just trying to support the next generation of entrepreneurs. And then uh, I work with private equity firms. And that's one of the things that you learn as an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you can actually level up. So now I work with, you know, a $10 billion private equity firm to do corporate carve outs and buyouts that, that I actually also uh, take over and run. And uh, that's one of the awesome things about entrepreneurship is like the level of promotion that you get that you would never get if you worked at a company um, is pretty amazing. So, you know, once you sell a company, uh, you know, say you do that in a few years, uh, you're all of a sudden, you know, incredibly sought after and, and people are asking you to do a lot of other things. And maybe the, the next things that you get are things that are at scale. And if somebody else was competing against you to get that job, uh, it would take them 20 years and it might have taken you two years. So uh, I don't pretend I'm smarter than anybody else. I just had a higher risk tolerance and, and made it work. So now that's what I do is uh, kind of like larger transactions with private equity firms. No, that's, that's great. Uh, so I sort of came into my own as it relates to business development. Uh, as a former techie, as a person who preferred to code and not interact with other humans, uh, that's, that's been a huge <laughs> gain for me. So I know this, that you tend to focus on business development. And do you have any suggestions on how we can approach building a company if we're more on the technical side, right? Because that sales, that's the pipeline of growth. Uh, can you talk about how you've done that? Um, is it hiring the right people? Is it leveraging your network? Is it all of that? Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, totally. Like, uh, so, you know, if you're technical, you're actually probably in a better position. And, um, you know, because, you know, having a, a big mouth like I do, that just like puts a lot of lipstick on the pig. Like that doesn't do anything. Uh, you know, you, know you, can, you can create uh, all you want, but if you don't have a great product, that's, that's, that gets seen through really quickly. So if you're technical, uh, then it's, you, you create something awesome and you pair with somebody that you can find, uh, like a loudmouth like me, that will do that. And that's what I've done in all the companies. I never wrote any of the code to any of the companies uh, that I started, I partnered up and, and, uh, and, and everybody shared in that success. So I actually think if you're technical, you're, you're, you're in a better position, but you just have to get out of your comfort zone to meet more people that um, can open those, like that, that business perspective for you. But if I looked at a deal as an angel and I said, oh, here's a big talker versus a incredible product builder as an angel, since it's so early, you want the product guy uh, way before you need the loud mouth. No, thanks. That's, that's super helpful. Any questions? I don't, I don't want to hog all the time here, so... Yeah, so I'm curious, Devin, how do you prioritize where you spend your time now? I, you, you said yourself, right? You're pretty solid after. How do you, like, are you passionate about specific areas? How do you choose? Yeah, that's what happens. Like, when you're in, like, when you've done something, you all of a sudden learn you're, like, mainly a one-trick pony. Like, I mainly work with, like, data companies, and I'm sought after for data-specific things. Like, nobody's calling me to, like, open up a restaurant. Uh, you know, like I'm just, uh, so, so what happens is you learn that you own your lane and a lot of people like, you know, might dabble in investments and other things, but if you're, if you're going to like focus your time and energy on something, it's usually because you have uh, a specific domain expertise. And so that's where I, I focus on is owning the domain. And then I invest in other stuff that, uh, you know, I pretend I'm really smart at, but I'm really not. No, thanks. There's, there's a question over the chat from Jonathan. How you doing, Jonathan? Hey, uh, thanks. <laughs> go ahead. Oh. If you... Yeah, Devin, I, I was uh, kind of in the same boat as you. My, my background is more sales and business development. And I've got an idea that I'm working on here and um, got some traction initially, but I need to recruit a technical co-founder. Um, I'm having some conversations with VCs and they're wanting to see the whole team come together. Um, the concept's solid, but... but uh, to really do the coding and uh, development work is going to be the next key step for me. So just wanted to pick your brain on uh, how you went about finding technical co-founders and any recommendations you might have. Yeah, so like I would open source a lot of work. Like I would put stuff out and open source it. 
uh, and say like, hey, you know, uh, looking for somebody to build X, Y, and Z. Looking, so I put it on like, you know, used to one company used to be called like Elance, and there's some other stuff. But so many times it's just like, you know, brute force. Like, also I would like see who can get college credit for building shit. Like, you know, like I do like the cheapest possible methods of getting people, uh, you know, bought in, and all of a sudden naturally maybe a co-founder exists. But usually you can't like hang a shingle on the door and be like, hey, I've got a great idea. Somebody do all the work and build it for me. Usually it comes because people get excited about it. There's a vision associated to it uh, because, you know, you've, you've put it out there and you've built up some groundswell for the idea. And then people come or, or, you know, like I said, you do something where they can trade benefit, immediate benefit, not, you know, uh, 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 predictive benefit but they can trade immediate benefit like college credit so uh, I, I i did that you know in colleges and uh and that worked and it produced people that actually in, in some cases they dropped out to be uh techno co-founders and their like mothers called me and were pissed off and then <laughs> they like made a couple million dollars and then their mom stopped calling me so usually that's uh that's how i did it yeah so, so along those lines you think it's okay um maybe bring on a part-time co-founder a technical co-founder and then outsource work overseas. Uh, what, what do you think yeah. Like, I mean, really all you gotta do is whatever it takes. Yeah. So like, gotcha. I don't care if it's all of the above, like a part-time co-founder that is also overseas, you know, like the world is so small nowadays, particularly, you know, with COVID, it doesn't matter if like, I haven't seen Kevin in forever and he's just down the road. Like, like he could be in Africa and I would have no idea. He could be in, you know, Europe and I'd have no idea. So, you know, the world is small and if you use offshore and a, a component of all of it, it usually, you know, can work now. I do have a, a quick warning on outsourcing. Just be sure you have a good team. Um, I know in some colleagues have outsourced and there have been some language and cultural barriers. We're going sort of into the, the red and blue lens. So just make sure that you have a good relationship with the person that can communicate to the team wherever they are exactly what you want, right? Um, so just keep that in mind. Because sometimes it's nice to be able to, to check in with people physically that's building your code. Um, but just just something to think about. And so we'll, we'll take one more question and we'll wrap it up. I know Devin's a busy guy and um, I've got three little ones that are wanting to go to bed. So um, yeah, we'll take uh, one more question and close it down. Anybody else? So I'll, I'll ask the last question. So, so Devin, are, are you looking for any great startups that, you know, could possibly come out of MIT by some well-seasoned experienced management <laughs> and, yeah. and how would they get in contact uh with you yeah that, that that that's all i'm looking for uh you know i have a pretty unique name so if you just put in devin.wejsinger at gmail.com uh there is nobody else that has that uh last name uh and, and actually combination of all and you know i'm on twitter linkedin all that stuff like if there's anything that you know seems really interesting um i i can be super helpful in some areas and then really completely a waste of your time in other areas. But usually, you know, if it's, uh, you know, at an early, early stage, I'll be able to be useful, uh, whether I'm going to be able to roll up my sleeves and invest directly. It's only, only because I know my lane or not. Um, but I, 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 if it sounds, you know, really, if it sounds compelling and unique, uh, it's not hard to, you know, be the WD 40 that gets you the rest of the way. With that said, thank you so much. It's been great to see you. Thanks to everyone that joined us and, and stayed on. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, see your faces. Hopefully we'll be able to see each other in person. Uh, good night and feel free to reach out to me if there's any way that I can help you all. Thanks again, Valentina and Angel. Good night. Thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.